Hi, welcome to the Signal Pad. In this episode, I have another product review for you guys. This is the iTech IT9121 digital power meter. Now, I'd never heard of this brand iTech before, but I was looking for a benchtop, small, compact form factor uh, digital power meter that can give me a lot of information. It's very helpful, especially in repairs, where you can diagnose to see if there are any power supply problems of whatever instrument you're working on. And then, to my surprise, I found out that iTech has a huge catalog of everything power related power supplies dc electronic loads power meters of almost every combination that you can imagine so definitely go check them out but today we're going to take a look at this particular unit and see what its capabilities are including a teardown and i have a whole bunch of experiment that i want to do with it and see how well it performs so let's get started and here's the front of the IT9121 digital power meter. It has a very simple design philosophy, as you would expect from an instrument like this. You don't want to complicate things. We have a USB port in the front. We have a hard power button and a group of selection soft buttons on the side, which help you navigate the GUI, as we will see. There are really four main buttons which are LED backlit. And these are the four main operation modes of this instrument. We will take a look at all of them in detail, harmonics, meter integration mode, and the scope mode. And a couple of other switch, switches really just for navigating the GUI again. It does have a rotary knob. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any clicks. So you're going to have to go back and forth a couple of times. It's OK. It really doesn't matter so much. Now, over here, there are actually uh, available areas for front uh, plug connectors, like some kind of a banana connector, but this is not populated in this particular chassis, but it could have been. And I think having the current and voltage, at least maybe the low end of the current and the full range of the voltage available in the front as well, would have been really nice. As we will see, this is basically two independently sample channels and they're fully isolated from each other so you can have a pretty powerful for some doing some quick measurements around the lab and we can see the capabilities of that as well let's take a look at the back and here is the back of the instrument and look at how many interfaces it provides you with we have gpib lan usb and rs232 so no matter what kind of communication you have let's say a set of code base written for you can always add this instrument to your setup we also have the current input 20 amp in this case voltage 600 volts and it uses the two independent samplers on these two in order to do all the digital power meter calculations. There's also a terminal over here, which is, allows you to use external shunts and so on. So this current measurement here uses an internal shunt, as we will see during the teardown. And if you don't want to use the internal one, you want to use more current, so you have a different detector somewhere else, you can always use this terminal. And you can see this screwed in with a cap because this will be live connected to the rest of the measurements. So they've done a very good job in making sure everything is secure. For instance, there is a cover that comes with the current measurement ports. It has captive screws, so the screws will not fall out. These little details do make a big difference, and it goes into metal inserts inside the chassis. Of course, this is because the current measurements can be on the high side. So you can have a couple of hundred volts present on these terminals, and you have to really well isolate them. These banana plugs are internal, and then the cables that come with the instrument do a very good job at protecting you. So they have thought about that fairly carefully. There's a synchronous port as well, power input, of course. Everything else is pretty self-explanatory. So in terms of design, I think being able to be usable is fantastic. As I said, if these terminals, at least the low end of the current was available in the front of the instrument, it would be great as well. Now, I think we should take a look inside this unit and then put it to some actual experiments. And if you're going to do a lot of AC line testing, this particular unit is a great accessory for the IT9121. This is the ITE185, and this is essentially an interface between AC outlets in your country and the device under test, which can be pretty much anything, your power supplies, LEDs, uh, motors, or whatever you want to connect to it. And it provides a safe, secure, and consistent way of connecting the DUT to the digital power meter. In the front, you can connect up to 250 volts, 15 amps, and this plug is obviously adjusted depending on where you are in the world and what kind of power outlet you want. You just plug this directly into the wall. And on top of this, there is a circuit diagram on how to connect this into the digital power meter. It essentially just translates the shunt current and the voltages directly into the unit, and you don't have to uh, worry about building those wires yourself. And this comes with the necessary cables to make that connection, which is great. What also makes it very convenient is that in the front, you have an outlet which is compatible with a variety of different kind of plugs giving you kind of a, a global compatibility 250 volts 15 amps is the maximum rated uh, for this particular box and there is a circuit breaker built into it too so you can turn your device under test on and off and if it exceeds 15 amps it will pop the circuit breaker again protecting everything it's nice and safe and secure properly grounded we will take a look at inside this as well and when we do our experiments with some of the uh, normal household items we will be using this one 
So let's take a close look inside the IT9121 and it has a very nice clean design. The architecture is essentially the same across all these type of instruments now. It's become an industry standard by which you have the main board at the bottom that performs all the unique functions of this particular instrument, in this case being a power meter, let's say. And then you have separate boards that handle all of the digital and peripheral connections and potentially even have another board on top of that. So this one takes advantage of this, goes one step further and has the ARM SDM microprocessor application processor on an entirely separate board which plugs into the main carrier. This creates three layers where you can separately program this and depending on what instrument you're using, plug it into a digital board and that makes the power meter and then combine it with this of course and so on and on and this allows you to create a family of products all based on the same core let's say processor with different firmwares and unique analog boards at the bottom. We have our main power supply here. This power supply does nothing more than providing the necessary power to the processor display and the functions on the board. This is not involved in providing power to the DUT, of course, that comes from the outside entirely. So you can see two separate sections, the bottom here, we're going to take a closer look, which seem very similar. They were both under some can here, so probably all the sensitive analog functions analog to digital conversion and so on is handled over here. Lots of isolation, both optical, galvanic, as well as different cuts through the boards can be seen, which is not surprising. This is a 600 volt class instrument, has to be really well protected, especially separated from the anything that goes into the user interface. So we'll take a look at that too. There's an Altera Max 10 here, which seems to be handling, let's say, some of the GPIB functions and is all routed, of course, to the main application processor in the center. There are some more IO control. Two ribbon cables, one to the front, so it's clear that this front display is fully controlled by the back over here as well. We have a mechanical power switch over here, filtering directly on the line. That's all on the main board in the back, too. Those are considered part of the main power meter interconnect. Let's say it doesn't have its own separate board. So once we take this off, we should be able to see the analog board a little bit better and to a comparison between the two channels, which are most likely the current and the voltage channels. Now, before I take it apart anymore, I do want to show you a few places where they have paid really nice attention to details. For instance, everything is he has silicone down in place, so all the ribbon cables are protected. They even have a nice little zip tie closing that so that it doesn't just bounce around and potentially get scratched against all the other interconnects that are underneath which are high voltage. Good to see. We also see for instance that all the screws here to the main board also have anti-slip glue applied to them so they don't open up uh, due to vibration and so on. There's a lot of manual work that's gone into this. Very nice protection here. Ground is nicely connected in multiple places. Everything shrink tube. Yeah, quite good. And so with the digital board out of the way, we can take a look at all the mixed signal functions and the core design of this power meter. At the top right, we have the AC line coming in and a cutout in the board, a couple of protection circuits, some common mode inductors and the mechanical switch over there. So this is really only involved in as far as passing the AC line with the front end switch that's connected mechanically into the power supply. That said, it's not really part of the power meter in any other way. At the very top over here, then we have a, our first DSP processor. This is part of the analog devices shark processor family, 32-bit, 40-bit floating point processor with a lot of different interfaces, allowing you to do DSP computation locally on this. Very useful for doing FFTs, which is needed on the two channels in order to get all the total harmonic distortion and grab the phase differences between the voltage and the current to calculate everything you need uh, for the power meter, of course. So they're dumping all of that calculation directly onto this. There's some headers probably for programming, and this is the only botched on component that I actually saw in the entire design, as far as I can tell. On the other side of it, we have an Altera Max 2 FPGA or CPLD, and this is a glue logic allowing you to connect all the peripherals together. This is in fact interfacing with the DSP of course and is also interfacing with a lot of other things here because these two front-end samplers need to be controlled somehow as they do auto-ranging and control various peripherals as we shall see. Then moving on over here, we see two transformers. These two transformers are obviously for passing the DC power required to power on these samplers. If you look carefully, aside from having cut out between the two samplers, there's also a big, big gap in the copper of the instrument itself. So this entire section is completely isolated from everything and it has to be because this is a 600 volt class instrument and you could have up to 600 volt RMS on these two voltage inputs and so you really have to be isolated from everything else that has user connection as well as everything else that is the digital portion of this instrument. And so by using these two MOS switches at the top, you can create essentially a DC-DC converter with these two 
transformers and then all the power handling and regulation is of course on the other side on the secondary side of these dc dc converter transformers now as far as the data going in and out there are two silicon labs quad opto isolators these are digital isolators on both sides and there's a cutout underneath the board as well this allows the data to be pushed in and the data to be pushed out so they can control whatever is over here and they can read back from it whatever that they need to so over here, the tiny components that you see, one over here and one over here, these are actually our analog to digital converters. These are linear technologies, LTC 2376. These are 18-bit, 250 kilo sample per second, successive approximation ADCs with 102 dB of signal-to-noise ratio. That's quite good. It's very close to ideal, actually, for an 18-bit converter. And these guys have an SPI interface, and that makes it quite simple because the SPI interface doesn't have that many... IOs and therefore can be handled through these silicon labs up to isolators and that that's it that's really all there is to it in terms of getting data in and out of these modules and underneath this is probably all the analog conditioning and unfortunately this is soldered in so I'm not going to remove it for the first round of looking at it but this is going to have all the switching required to auto range this so that you can measure things from down to volts all the way to 600 this line coming over here from the two voltage inputs going directly under there now I hope that there's a fuse underneath this chassis because if something happens to this line coming in, let's say some short circuit happens because of some problem or you overload it, there should be some protection there so that this line doesn't end up just melting because you have this connected directly to the AC voltage and this line could be capable of delivering you know, hundreds of watts so you have to be careful with that. So I hope that there's something underneath there. Now, on the right side, things are quite a bit more interesting because measuring voltage in a way is, well, it's kind of easy because you just have to make sure you auto range it. You compress the dynamic range within the dynamic range of analog to digital converter and you're done. But on the other side, you have a huge amount of current coming in and the amount of current coming in can have an enormous dynamic range from milliamps to tens of amps as this instrument is capable of. So you need some way of switching it. Now switching it in a solid state way is going to be very tough because of many reasons in terms of being able to switch something reliably and being able to take the voltage and being able to have a reliable constant resistance. So what they've done over here, they're using two very large relays. And these two relays essentially switch the ranging of the current from a small resistor, sense resistor down the middle, over there that's actually resistor, this blue component, to a very large one that's probably underneath this heatsink. You can hear this relay actually switch when you're operating this as you adjust the amount of current going in and out. There's also a back-to-back -back diode protection over here in case something goes wrong. Now the reliability and the repeatability of these relays are very important because they're going to switch back and forth and whatever resistance that they produce is first calibrated of course, but as this device ages, that variation in the resistance would directly translate to incorrect reading of the current. So that is something that I hope that they have taken into account. But other than that, once you have a resistor and then you pass a voltage through it, you can then measure, of course, and amplify, and then do exactly the same thing you've done on the voltage side to get the data out through here and into the DSP. In terms of controlling all of this, a similar way, you have a line coming in and it goes through there and controls everything you need to control. And keep in mind that this, because it handles so much current, it, it can also have a lot, a huge voltage potential difference than to ground and even with respect to the different nodes of these voltages. So all of that protection also has to be built into this. There's another item here I want to mention before I forget. So assuming that this heatsink is actually on the high current sense resistor, it's very important to increase the thermal mass of that resistor. First of all, you don't want it to get very hot because as soon as it gets hot, its own resistance goes up, assuming that it has a positive resistance coefficient. And in that situation, you will have a wrong reading because you're going to have a different sense resistor than you actually think you do, unless there is a temperature measurement and compensation loop and so on that's wrapped around it. Now, at the same time, you also want that resistor to have a very high thermal mass so that it doesn't have a very short thermal time constant. Otherwise, it's going to track, temperature is going to track the current through it in an AC condition. So as the current goes up on a rising cycle of the waveform, the temperature goes up, therefore the resistance goes up, so your measurement is going to, say, a higher current. And as it goes back down, it's going to cool down, you're going to report a lower current, which means you're going to have a nonlinearity induced by the changing of the resistance of this as a function of the waveform. So you obviously don't want that, because otherwise you're just going to think that your waveform is more nonlinear than it actually is. This is not a problem for power meters alone, of course, but in a high power situation like this, when you're dealing with sampling the AC line 
uh, at a very high rate, that can indeed be a problem when you do DSP. You can correct it afterwards if you know the characteristic, but I think that's what this heat sink is here is for. And I have seen other power meters that do not have this, so this is a very nice addition. And here's inside of the ITE185, which can be connected to this instrument. And look how nice it is. I have to say it's very well manufactured. Everything is properly crimped. Ground is properly connected. There's a distribution center in the middle, which technically isn't even fully necessary, but this makes it quite hackable, actually, because you can remove and separate this without disturbing the other two halves and rewire them or remove a broken component without having to disconnect it from the other side. It's excellent. And it also, they all, all have anti-loosening uh, gel applied to all the interconnects, you know, shrink tube in the right places, the right length of cables, the right gauge of the cables. Yeah, it's really quite good. I'm eager to put it to the test. Let's take a quick look at the GUI because I think they've done a great job at making things that can become very complicated in a simple way. So depending on how much information you want to see, you can configure the GUI fairly easily. Under the meter mode, which is the primary function when the instrument uh, boots up, we have the basic voltage and current measurement. So I can go from different pages here. So here's all the voltage measurements. You can go to the next one, more voltage measurements. Here's the current ones power measurements and the inrush current and voltage measurements. But at the same time, you can in display even more information. So on the view 4 mode, you can see voltage and current next to each other. And on the view 12, you have a ton of information, everything from power factor, quality factor, uh, frequencies, phase, everything is in here. And you can go page after page and get all the information you want. Now, of course, once you digitize the waveforms, grabbing all this information is not difficult, but the way they manage to put it on the screen, depending on how much you want to see at a time, I think is really great. On the, the integration tab here, then you will see energy consumption calculations. You can define how long you want to calculate, how long you want to integrate. Basic power consumption, energy consumption measurements can be done here. The scope uh, measurement and the scope function is surprisingly good, and we will see that too. Here you can get a live waveform of both current and voltage, and it will do a fairly good job at auto-triggering and auto-scaling it. You can obviously always adjust the rate and the settings of the scope measurements too. And finally, we have the harmonic measurements, where you can see the list of all the harmonics and the various relationships between the nonlinearities of the voltage and the current, which is a really important measurement for power meters because it tells you what kind of harmonic noise you're injecting into your power grid. And this is pretty important, especially for, let's say, audio e equipment measurements where you don't want to get some of that noise coming out. So those are the really basic four functions. All of them can be configured in individually and independently, I think they've done, again, a pretty good job. So because this is an instrument that can measure down to DC, let's do some basic DC measurements. So under the meter mode, in theory, I should be able to measure voltage and current fully independently, all the way up to 600 volts and 20 amps, and look at them side by side from two different sources. Let's see how accurate it is and how well it works. So I'll be using the cables that are shipped with the instrument to make the connection and they're quite good in terms of safety because they do have this sleeve which is spring loaded so that it doesn't, you are not able to touch it. As you can see it's fully, fully protected in all directions. The problem I find is that this spring here is actually quite strong which means that when you plug it into the banana plug in the back it doesn't take a lot of force to pop it right out. And, and every once in a while it just pops out if you know if you just tug on the cable a little bit. Now it's not dangerous because it's immediately covered, so it doesn't matter. It's just a bit of an annoyance. I think they need to either improve the grip of this cable to the back of the unit or perhaps get something that has a less springy action. And so in order to measure some DC values, I have the 2470 to provide voltage to the instrument and the 2460 to provide some current. Now these are fully isolated from each other and of course so is the power meter. I just have it simply connected to the back of the unit. So I should be able to dial in anything I want and we can take a look at the accuracy of this instrument at DC. So let's try some really small values. So I have the source meter set to 100 millivolts, I'm going to enable that. There you go. Perfect. Exactly 100 millivolts. It's just a one digit that jumps up and down at the end. Now this is measuring volts RMS. Of course, volts RMS and volt DC will be the same thing in this case. So it's measuring it no problem. Now the instrument somehow ignores anything less than 70 millivolts or so. I'm not sure why. There's some threshold for which it basically doesn't display anything. It probably doesn't think anyone's going to measure any real power measurement below 100 millivolt. But for instance, if I go to 150 millivolt, you can see that it has no problem displaying it, and I can increment it by one millivolt exactly, so 151 millivolt, and you can see, no problem, so it does a really good job. We can also push it to much, much higher. Let's try 100 volts. There you go, 100 volts. Now there's a little bit of an offset afterwards. Now we can go all the way to its maximum, which is 600 volts. 
and again no problem 600 volts and of course the you know, frequency is zero hertz it does measure some volt peak to peak at 0.33 that's probably not true i don't think the source and measure unit does not produce that so this must be its own internal error that it is measuring let's go ahead and try the 2460 we can do the similar thing i can turn on 100 microamp of current which is also quite small and indeed it does measure 100 microamp no problem and we can push it higher we can go to five five amps for example here's five amp there we go the relay just clicked inside and it switched to a higher range you can see it switched to the five amp range and it reads that perfectly fine so it does a really good job with those and you know measures power of course as a result of these the power factor and all that here this is for a dc so that's why i wanted to have front panel connectors because you can indeed use this as two independent voltage and current measured desktop units so let's now extend our test into the ac domain Remember, we're still testing the digital power meters, GUI interfaces, measurement capabilities, and some of its internal functions. Here I have a two-channel Tektronix AFG31000 arbitrary waveform generator, and I have channel 1 connected to the voltage input and channel 2 connected across the current. Now, this is a 50-ohm instrument, which means that when the output of the channel 1 is connected to the voltage port, we are essentially driving into an open circuit, and on the channel 2, we're driving into a short circuit, which means that the current coming out of the channel 2 is whatever voltage is present, and divide by 50 ohms and the output of the channel 1 is just double what is shown on the screen because it's assuming a 50 ohm termination. Nonetheless we're not really interested in the exact voltage and current values we're more interested in the functionality of the digital power meter we know it's going to be accurate. So I'm going to go zoom back over here I'm going to change the different kind of waveforms applied and we can see how well the digital power meter handles various waveforms. Let's go ahead and enable the voltage here there's our voltage input. I'm applying 1.7 volts RMS into a 50 ohm load, which in this case into an open would be twice as much, 3.4 volts RMS. That's exactly what we're getting from the instrument. And the voltage peak to peak, two times square root two times the RMS value for a sinusoid. That's also correct. The frequency is 400 Hertz. It's been correctly detected too. I'm going to enable now the current which is a voltage into a short circuit through a 50 ohm resistor and that we're getting about 66.88 milliamp RMS. Now what's important to note here is that the power factor is one and the reason is because the voltage and the current are perfectly in phase and therefore the apparent power 0.229 VA and the real power 0.229 watts are exactly the same. That's for instance a perfectly resistive load. That's exactly what we would expect the instrument to tell us. If I go on next page over here, which shows you a different configuration of measurements, you can see that the phase between the voltage and the current is zero. That's because they're exactly on top of each other, but I can introduce a phase on purpose. Let's go ahead and enter 90 degrees, for example. Now, 90 degrees is exactly the opposite condition. Right? This is negative 90 because it's lagging versus leading. But in this situation, if I go back, you can see that the Apparent power hasn't changed, of course, but the real power is now zero because the power factor is also zero. This would be equivalent to, let's say, driving a per perfect ideal inductor or a capacitor, depending on leading or lagging. In that situation, there is current flowing, but it's going back and forth, and there is no actual power consumption in total. That's a perfectly reactive load. And we can we'll go over here, you can see the minus 90 degrees. I can also emulate the other condition by entering the opposite, let's say a minus 90 degree value. Let me go ahead and enter that, minus 90 degrees. And there you go, you can see swapping to the other phase. Of course, this makes no difference to the actual power consumption because it's exactly the opposite condition. But everything else has been detected perfectly correctly. And it is, again, basic calculations and it's working and it's doing what we expect. We can also switch to the scope mode and see the actual waveforms that is being captured. Here we go, there is our two waveforms. Blue here is our current and red here is our voltage. Now the vertical spacing is determined by whatever is picked over here. So in terms of the voltage, the smallest vertical spacing is 15 volts per division. And the smallest current I believe is five. There it is, yeah, it is five milli milliamp per division. Everything else in terms of horizontal, trigger level, all of that can be done automatically or it can be adjusted by selecting one of these functions at the bottom. Or you can turn, you know, different waveforms on and off as you want to. I find this to be really helpful because you, if you have some really unusual waveform and some weird spikes that are happening, let's say, in some kind of a DC-DC power conversion you have, you can catch it over here within the limits of the sampling of this instrument, of course. But it's quite, quite nice. And you can set the various triggers, what kind of trigger you want, where you want the trigger to be captured from, just like a regular oscilloscope. And I think it's, it's actually quite good. So let's go ahead and try and change, let's say, the waveform. I'm going to change the current waveform from a sinusoid into a square. You can see, perfectly fine. It detects it, and it does that no problem. We can do the same thing with the voltage, and you can see that the triggering 
uh, does not get affected. It does a good job at detecting and automatically setting that. At the same time, we can also look at the phase. So let's say I change the phase from zero degrees to 90 degrees, like we had before. You can see a shift in the phase. It's basically a two-channel, fully independent oscilloscope running at fairly low sample rate, but very high resolution. Now, these waveforms are quite linear, which means that if I go under the harmonic measurement, you can see that the harmonic measurement for the voltage has only a single harmonic, and that's the fundamental 400 hertz frequency that's coming in. I can switch that to current as well. You can see it's a perfect waveform, but I can change that. Let's go ahead and change the current waveform from a sinusoid into a square wave. Here we go, square wave. And right off the bat, we can see all the odd harmonics appearing. Now, the voltage is still perfectly linear, so the harmonics are not there. But now, all of a sudden, you can see the current. Now, it doesn't really make a difference in this case, because the voltage has no power in those frequencies. Only the current does. So it does take that into account when it is calculating, of course, various power measurements under this condition. But it's very important to see the harmonics if you want to know if your circuit is injecting noise into the power grid, as I said earlier. You can also go under the setup and tell the instrument how many harmonics to take into account, what kind of PLL it's going to use for the source, in this case it's using the voltage, and how the total harmonic distortion formula is calculated. All of the different ways this instrument uses the mathematics to figure out all the different parameters are detailed in the manual with the exact equations written there which you can reference to make sure that the instrument is doing what you think it's doing. Overall, I have to say it's quite good. Now that we've done all of these tests, we should really turn into some basic household uh, equipment to use as a device under test here and see what kind of waveforms we get from them under practical conditions. So here's our first setup for measuring something off the shelf. So this is an Anker USB-C power supply. This is a 60-watt capable unit, and right now it's not charging anything. It's just sitting plugged in, and we have a battery pack here, which is a USB-C power pack, and this can be charged at 30 watts. So we're going to see what happens when you connect it and disconnect it and how the digital power meter is going to analyze that waveform. At the same time, the signal going into this accessory is coming from a variac, so we can adjust the voltage too if we want to and see what happens to the charger under various conditions. Okay, let's go ahead and enable the variac. There it is. Now we're reading, what are we reading over here? About 75 volts RMS. Let me increase that to get to about North American 120, roughly. There you go, there's 120, 121 volts, and we have a 60 hertz frequency, exactly what you expect. Right now, we're not taking any current at all, because even though the charger is plugged into the accessory, the circuit breaker is not on, which is quite convenient to have on there. Let's go and enable that. There we go. Now, as soon as I turn it on, right off the bat, this power supply inside the charger is going to power on. It's going to analyze and figure out, is, is there anything connected to the USB-C? It's going to go through some internal checking. And initially, it's burning about 1.8 VA apparent power and only 300 milliwatt of actual power. That's because the power factor is 0.16, which means that this is essentially a purely reactive load. Now it has fully settled down. And the power factor is now almost zero. And it's consuming 150 milliwatt. This is good. It means if you plug this power supply in and it's not connected to anything, you're basically throwing away about 150 milliwatt of power continuously. And that's the cost of running the internal DC-DC converters, having the LED on, and having the, the microprocessor in there monitoring all the USB-C activity. It's still pretty good. If I look at the waveform, under this condition. You can see that indeed we have the voltage in red and the current has a lot of noise on it. And that's because a lot of DC-DC converter activity going on in there, a lot of switching happening. And it's fairly small. It's only 20 milliamp per division and it's a reactive load. Let's go back under the meter again. So I'm going to now plug it into the battery pack and the battery pack is going to try and take as much as 30 watts from this to charge the battery. And plugging it in, let's see what happens. There's going to be some agreement on power delivery. There it is. Look at that. 33 watts. That's the actual power being delivered to the battery. The apparent power is still 53 VA. That's because the power factor is 0.618. And that is normal for a DC-DC converter. You are going to have some non-idealities in the power factor because it is not a pure resistive load. And there are power supplies with power factor correction to emulate the resistive load as much as possible and also even just to not produce harmonics. Let's take a look and see what is the phase relationship. So it reports the phase relationship to be minus 51.2 degrees and I think it's making a small calculation error. It's probably because the shape of the waveform is really strange. Let's take a look. 
yeah, there you go. As you can see, the current and the voltage are actually in phase. They're not out of phase. So it should say zero, but it doesn't do that calculation correctly. Again, it's probably because of the weird shape of the current waveform there. Let's go back over here. So you can see at the peaks of the voltage, the DC-DC converter draws a spike of current, and that current is then goes through the DCC conversion, bring, comes back down to the appropriate voltage, and then goes into the battery. There are power supplies that try to smooth this out. Now, the consequence of these pulse trains, even though it is perfectly in phase, is that this is going to have a quite poor harmonic content. And if you, therefore, that harmonic content is going to be within the audible range if it's connected to something that doesn't filter it very well. Let's go over to the harmonics over here. There it is, exactly as I thought. Here it is, so the I, that's the, volt, that's the current measurement, and of course these spikes are going to have a lot of s a third and fourth and fifth and other harmonics there. In, in, in this one is symmetric, so it only has the odd harmonics. And the THT is 77%. That's quite bad. And that means that if you have something that's unfiltered, yeah, you're going to hear this. Now the voltage is going to be very linear because there's a very little harmonic content on the voltage waveform. is coming from the variac, and it is uh, at the same voltage line coming in. So you don't see much nonlinearity there. Let's go back over here to the current. Yeah, and it, this is going to be quite bad. Now if I go over the waveform again, we can go ahead and unplug it from the battery pack and see what happens. You go, as soon as I unplug it, this is the initial power on. You can see it's still looking. It's checking to see what happened to the USB, and then it gives up on that and just goes back to being a very reactive load, consuming very little power. Let's go ahead and plug it back in. There you go. It detects that there is something there, some handshaking, and goes back to the current it used to be. So I think it works really well. I can go ahead and reduce the voltage from the variac. You can see as I reduce the voltage, it is increasing the amount of current spikes it's taking. It actually switched scale. That's because it wants to continue to deliver the 33 watts. So even though I reduce the voltage, if I back go back to the meter, look at that, it's still delivering 33 watts. And it's delivering it at a much lower voltage, which means it's taking more current. So the DC-DC converter circuitry is accommodating that. Eventually, if you go low enough, then it just gives up and disconnects everything. So yeah, works quite well. You can see how much information you can extract from this, that the THD actually changed as a result of that. And there's got a little bit worse THD on the voltage too. So if something's wrong with the DC-DC converter, you can grab that, you can find the THD, you can find the waveforms using a digital power meter. That's exactly why this is done. We can also take advantage of the integration function. So while we know that the battery pack is consuming 33 watts, we can go under the integration and we can define a particular integration period. We can even take inrush currents into account and so on, and we can start the integration. And what this does is it calculates what is the total amount of energy that this instrument has delivered to its device under test. Now, if you know something about the efficiency of the DC-DC converter and the efficiency of the converter, the charging circuitry inside the battery pack, you can even calculate the capacity of the battery pack. But this is actually more interesting to calculate how much power you draw from the AC outlet to fully charge this battery if you do know its capacity. And that gives you then the efficiency of the system. And for a lot of, let's say, wireless chargers, this will be quite an eye opener. So you can see how much energy is thrown away for the convenience of something being wirelessly charged, even in near field. So that's a quite useful feature as well. Okay, let's try one other thing. Here I have a workshop LED that is first directly connected to our accessory over here. I also have an off-the-shelf dimmer. These are really, really simple dimmers where you just plug this into the outlet you want and you plug whatever you want on the other side. These are most likely triac based. So we're going to compare and see what happens when we put the dimmer in line and how it affects the performance of the LED and what kind of waveforms in terms of voltage and current we get under those conditions. So first, the LED by itself. Let's turn it on. Here we go. So the LED is taking about 10 watts, which is correct. This is supposed to be about a 10 watt LED. Look at the power factor. It's fantastic. It's almost one. So it's acting almost like a resistive load. But what's more impressive about this LED are the waveforms. Look at these waveforms. The current and the voltage are essentially almost identical. And the THD of the current waveform is really quite good. So if I go over here, you can see that indeed the THD on the current, you only have about 14%. So this LED light, despite the fact that it has its own power supply built into it, behaves very much like almost like a resistive load and that's great because you have a lot of these in the house in many different places you don't want to put a lot of noise on the line and everything else makes perfect sense if i go over to the meter section again and go forward you can see that the phase lag is tiny it's minus 15 degrees so now i'm going to do exactly the same thing but i'm going to put the dimmer in line and see what happens <laughs> 
So let's set the dimmer to 100%, meaning that essentially it should provide as much power to the load as possible. It is as if it's not there. Let's go to the maximum. There it is. And look at that. So right off the bat, we're not getting our complete power back. And look at the power factor. It's already suffered. This 0.83 used to be 0.96. So there is a big difference now between the apparent power and the actual power. If I go over here, you can see that the phase difference between them has also changed. But the worst problem of this kind of dimmer is actually the waveform. Look at the difference in the waveform. It's a completely different mechanism uh, than it was before. This particular triac based ones will always give you these spikes. So there's a threshold where you get this big spike of current going into the power supply of the LED. So the triac and the power supply of the LED are interacting with each other, producing this kind of waveform. The problem here is, of course, that you're going to get a lot of harmonic content as a result of that. So the THD is now 44%, which is a lot worse than it was before. But as you change the dimmer and you make the LED dimmer, you actually make this problem worse. Let's give it a try. So I'm going to reduce. Look at that. The THT keeps getting worse and worse. Now we're at about 85%. If I go back to the waveform, that's because these spikes become narrower and narrower in width, and therefore will have higher power content in the higher frequencies in the other harmonics. If I go under the meter again, you can see what is going on in terms of the power. We're at 3.7 watts now, so we're about a third of the power. Let's go back down. Let's bring it down to, let's say, you know, 0.8 or maybe, let's say, 1 watt. And at 1 watt, this LED is still on, of course, and it doesn't flicker. That's because of its good power supply. If I go back to the harmonics, yeah, it's pretty bad, 97%. You can see the second harmonic or third harmonic in the fundamental are essentially the same power. Now, they're all roughly the same. That's the price to pay. So if you have a lot of these LEDs and use these cheap dimmers in the way, you're going to, yeah, you're going to put a lot of noise on the line. As a result, that noise will then radiate out of the power lines and then can be captured by something that you don't want it to pick it up. Going back over here again, yep, 0.9 watts, and then you can see that the major, major difference between the apparent power and the real power, because the power factor is now only 0.134. So that is exactly what a digital power meter is good for, to capture these things and characterize them so you know exactly what you're dealing with. The instrument, of course, comes with a full programming manual. You can write your own application and scripts to do the traditional analysis of this data. But it also comes with its own application, which is free to download, and it gives you a really nice bird's eye view of all the parameters that the instrument is calculating, far more than you can see on the instrument's LCD screen. And it gives you all the functionality, like the integration, the scope, the harmonic measurements, and so on, directly on here. I think the software is quite nice. The only problem with it is that it, every once in a while it freezes and then the communication just halts and then you have to restart the software. It could be a problem with my computer, it could be the driver or something like that. But anyway, I'm having had a quite a bit of difficulty getting it up and running. So for instance, right now the scope and the integration just disappeared from here, even though it was there just a moment ago. I think this needs to be a bit more polished. And if they do that, this is a fantastic accompanying software, especially since it's free. But yeah, like I said, you have to fix it in order to be able to use it. The scope function, when it does work, it's quite good. Unfortunately, right now it doesn't anymore, but it gives you a replica of what's on the screen and you can manipulate the waveform in exactly the same way. That's why I think that it's worthwhile making some changes to this and bringing it up to date. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this detailed review of the IT9121 digital power meter. It's going to be remaining on my bench now and it's going to be connected to all the different instruments we're going to repair in the future, especially with the additional accessory that comes with it. I think is is a great compact unit for my needs. If you like it, let me know in the comment section and if you have any questions, I'll try to answer it. As always, I'll see you next time. <music>